Modern Melbourne is a series of interviews that document the extraordinary lives and careers of some of our most important architects and designers. Today we speak with Peter McIntyre. After completing his education at RMIT and University of Melbourne, Peter went on to design and build one of Melbourne's most iconic houses, River House. In 1952, in partnership with Borland and Murphy, he won the competition to design the Melbourne Olympic Swimming Stadium. Both buildings established his position as Australia's leading experimental modernist. Let's start at the beginning. You followed in your father's footsteps in architecture, and now three out of four of your children have followed you. When did you realise that architecture was in your blood? Well, I didn't realise it was in my blood. I just grew up doing that. Uh, I didn't, I was young enough to un not understand what, what life was about, really. I just, um, uh, I started as an office boy when I was seven. The office was just coming out of the depression and it was sort of all hands to the pump. Uh, and in my school holidays, I'd always go to the office uh, all, all my life. And uh, when I came 16 <coughs> and left school, uh, the war, the, we were in the middle of the Second World War. And um, like a youth didn't really have much say. I didn't have any say. My father just enrolled me in architecture. Uh, and I'd, I'd had a very bad time at school in the last two years because of the army. The, I was in the cadets. And, um, you know, I was lumping 303s around and charging palliasses with bayonet and all that sort of stuff. And I didn't like that. And um, so I didn't like the last two years of school. Uh, but when I started first year architecture, I absolutely loved it. Not the architecture, the fact that there were girls. I'd never seen a girl in my life till I was six, uh, up to 16. Uh, so I very quickly got myself a girlfriend and uh, my life absolutely blossomed from that moment on. <laughs> but I, came, I became very serious about architecture after third year because <clears throat> that's when I uh, started uh, seeing Boyd and Roy Grounds and people like that. That's when I really started to understand about architecture. Well, I, I guess we can't speak about um, your time at your father's practice without talking about the magical land in which Riverhouse sits and where you still live. Right. Can you talk about how you came to find this yes, Melbourne well, piece that, of paradise? That, yes, well, that, that, that's also linked to my father's office. Um, a builder in the office, Bob Scott, um, when I, in the, we had a range of builders that worked for the firm, and Bob Scott bought this land uh, nearby here that... Uh, to uh, build a house on for his son. And I was sent out to do the survey. Um, and uh, this was 1947, so I, I um, would have been uh, maybe 18, I think. Uh, and um, I, I did the survey and then looked down to land, which was sweeping down to the river. Uh, and I've always been fascinated with water. Uh, in fact, I, I used to be like Huckleberry Finn on the Yarra. There was a guy in my class whose father owned the boat sheds at the bottom of Molesworth Street. And uh, after, in summer, we'd always go down there and swim in the river. So I came down here. It was very steep. I, it was no access. So I sort of slid down on my backside down here and walked over the place. And it was absolutely enchanting. I got down to this very bend where we're, where we're sitting now. And um, I could see a mile down one way of the river and a mile up the other way of the river. And I thought this was absolutely magical. So. On the following Saturday morning, I went down to Glenfrey Road and um, I went to a real estate agent. His name was Percy, I remember, Mr. Percy. And uh, sounds like a Dickens novel. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, he said, oh, look, I think this is uh, probably Crown Land, uh, you know, on the river and all that sort of stuff. And uh, he said, I'll, you know, have a look at it for you and see if I can find anything out. So he rang me back about three weeks later and he said, I found out what this is, and uh, it, it, I found the owner, uh, and uh, the, uh, the owner is prepared to sell it to you, uh, and um, uh, he, you know, here's the address and so forth. So I went to, to, to see them. Now, it was a Mr. Buchan, and he explained to me what the whole situation was, that his um, Victorian homestead um, uh, was at the top of the hill, uh, and it was called Finhaven, and it owned all the land here, 12 acres of it. 
And Mrs. Buchan died during the war, 1941, I think. Uh, and the, she had six children, but they're all in the services and all over the place. And it was decided that the house would be demolished. There was no trust, for, uh, <laughs> national trust. There was no, they demolished a beautiful Victorian house, Homestead, and they subdivided the land. And Tuxon, the surveyor who did the subdivision, said you can't actually build on this section. It's too steep, it's 45 degrees down here, and the bottom section is subject to flood. Uh, so that was just left. And Mr. Buchan, he was the, um, he was in charge of the estate, and he said to me that he'd sell it to me, but he said, um, I have to go to all my brothers and sisters, they have to approve it. So he said, I won't be able to get back to you for about uh, at least a month. And, uh, and that's, that's how it all started. The story goes on there. I could talk for about two days about what happened from there on, but I eventually got it. <laughs> and I, it's extraordinary that I got it because I was 18 and I didn't have any money at all. <laughs> and I, I always remember he looked across at me when it was agreed that I'd pay him, I think it was about 200 pounds. He, he, said, um, he said, would you like time to pay? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, what about six months? And I said, that would be fine. Yes. <laughs> so that's what I said about to raise the money. <laughs> and uh, I didn't raise it all. Um, my father, when I showed my father the land, he actually refused me, wouldn't allow me to buy it. He didn't know at that stage I'd already signed the contract. <laughs> but when he, uh, so I went ahead and tried to raise the money. And when he, uh, uh, when he found out, he, uh, the contract was signed and I, I got sick halfway through and he raised half of it. He then paid the balance of the contract, but he made me go back to his office and work off that money, yeah. He was a dour Scotchman, my father. Oh, very good. And is this at the time where Robin Boyd steps in? Yes, that's when I went to Robin. Uh, Robin was already my tutor at the university, but I went to Robin and um, asked him if I could do work in the Age Small Home Service because um, I could earn much more money there by doing little perspectives and alterations, extensions to houses and amendments to working drawings and things. <clears throat> so, you know, yes, I worked there. Mm. And so, and then that helped pay for, for the property, but only to a point. Oh, to, to a point, to yes. A point. <laughs> yeah. that, then it was a long road way back. I then had to build a road in. There was no access to it, you see. This is why my father was against it. You know. So Robin stepped in as a saviour, but did he also influence your early career? Yes, Robin uh, was the greatest. Robin and Roy Grounds were the greatest influence of my life. They just turned it all around. They were, Robin was an inspirational person, and uh, he was dedicated to uh, spreading the word of how important design was. And he loved Australia, and he was just so sad that uh, we weren't responding uh, to developing Australia as 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 we should have been, uh, responding to the climate. Uh, understanding how our cities were going to grow and why they why they should grow in certain ways. Um, and he did everything. He was he lectured, wrote articles, anything at, anything at all to actually spread the word. After 56, when television came in, he spent a great deal of time on television. Um, but he, his articles in the Age Small Home Service, Age, it was published every Monday morning, were inspirational. He had Melbourne actually just waited for his Monday morning article was so beautiful. He, um, but he, he wasn't without critics. Um, <laughs> you know, he he would draw sketches of modern houses and say how they work and so forth. And I do remember the occasion when somebody wrote in and said uh, uh, that that house that you published, it's really it's not not really fit to be a house. It's it's more like a hen's house. Mm -hmm. the, the following week, he wrote the most critical article, and the heading heading was. Um, a hen's house is not always a fowl house. <laughs> <laughs> he was so witty, you know, he was absolutely unbelievably witty. And so he could convey the message very brilliantly. Well, you both did in uh, 1957, I think, with the short film, Your House and Mine. That, was, that came much later. That, that was made in, um, because the period we're talking about now with Robin is in, say, 1947. But uh, that film was made, well, well how, I can tell you the story about how we came to make your house and mine. Um, <clears throat> one of the passions I had was uh, doing reviews at the university. And uh, every faculty had a review, but architects didn't have a review. Uh, there was the big review, which was the SRC review. 
Uh, so um, I wanted to get an architect review going. So the first review I think we did was 19, 1948, I think it might have been. And uh, it had to be a lunchtime review because we were in a minor way. We didn't have a great deal of acting talent, but what we had uh, is we had a great design sense. So we could make brilliant sets. And uh, I, I was directing these reviews. And uh, I, I just used speed. I'd use very simple, short sketches. And then the, the, no one had seen before the speed with which we did. The set would come on, there'd be a sketch, and then another, another sketch would come on. And so it was, it was almost like a moving film that came so fast. And um, that developed into, um, it became incredibly popular. And we almost got to the stage in the evening reviews where it was almost as big as SRC review. And um, one, one review we started having, it, what would happen in movies in those days is that there would always be uh, the main movie, main, we would call them pictures, I think, the main picture, and then there'd be a, a, a preliminary picture, and then there'd be a, an interval. And in the interval, there would be advertising, advertising films. So our night reviews were in two halves, and we decided to do a skit on um, the advertising. And the first skit we did was uh, based on Moldy's Breakfast Food. And uh, Robin wrote the most brilliant script, and I did the, the making of the film uh, about Moldy's food. And we, we developed from there, making bigger and better, better films. And um, Your House and Mine came right back in, uh, I think in um, 57, we made Your House and Mine. And uh, so that's, that was the background for Your House and Mine. But that was all part of what I was saying about Robin wanting to spread the word and so forth, yeah. Now much is written about River House, but you could say that your first built project, Castle House, um, is the first prototype in Opposing Forces, which the River House is um, built on. Can you tell me about that project? About the project or about the opposing forces? Well, they go together, I suppose. Well, um, <clears throat> in my final year, um, we uh, were introduced by an engineer called Norman Musson to um, pre-stressed and post-tangent reinforced concrete. And uh, these are fancy titles, but they're, they're really about uh, uh, inducing forces into a structure that opposes the forces that are going to come onto them when the structure's built. For example, you can take a beam and you can bend it so it's sort of up like this, and then when the forces come on, it comes back to the neutral axis. So, uh, and the, the, it was taught to us in a time when materials just after the war were very short. So there's a tremendous emphasis in the profession about saving materials, saving, uh, doing them in more economical ways. Uh, so I, I found that absolutely fascinating, and um, uh, the, uh, I was working on the design back in, in just after graduation on the design of this river house because I'd bought the land in '47 when I was a student, so it was always in my mind about doing it. So I, th this this house was designed, the river house was designed in '51, but in '51 also was when I designed the, the castle house, but then. I couldn't build this house because I didn't have the money, but I, we, the, the uh, castle house was erected. Uh, and it's just a question, a simple thing about opposing. The, the, um, why the design is like it is, uh, is because the owner had inherited the piece of land and he didn't like North Borwood, he didn't like suburbia. And he said to me, can you build me a house or design me a house that I'm not looking at suburbia? So um, we built a house that was looking up to the stars. So it was, it was known as the Stargazer House. And I had terrific trouble with getting the permit at uh, well, the Camberwell Council in those days. It wasn't Burundara Camberwell. And I had to go and uh, do a presentation to the full council to finally get the permit. And um, Robin wrote a lot about that in the, uh, in the Age paper article for the Small Homes. Mm -hmm. So that was the River House. Had, um, that was the, the two houses together. And did you have problems with the river house and the council in getting planning for no, this structure? No, extraordinary. No, that, was, that, that is the most extraordinary story. When I tell people about that, they just can't believe it. Um, in Kew, yeah, when I took the permit out, in Kew, there, were, there was no... This was before there was a Melbourne plan, which came in 54. So well before that, 
I applied to the um, uh, Kew Council for a permit. Now, uh, I took along a drawing, which I described in architectural terms. It was a drawing uh, of plans and elevations in eighth scale. Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a term of what scales that we'd use our drawings in. And um, I went to the Buildings Fair, uh, whose name was Chipperfield. And um, what I didn't know about Mr. Chipperfield is that he himself lived on the river over now in Kew, where the boulevard is. So I, I went in at about 2.30 in the afternoon and he looked at the drawings and he stamped them on the spot. <laughs> and I walked out about 20 minutes later with the permit. And the only thing he said to me is, make sure you're above flood level. But what I didn't understand is that he was, I think he was sympathetic because he lived on the river himself. But I wasn't asked for any structural computations. I wasn't asked for anything at all. And I... Uh, I, oh, yes, there was one conversation I had with them about permits, uh, and it was the fact that uh, in Kew, um, you weren't allowed to build a timber house. You had to build a brick house. There, it was uh, uh, areas which were dedicated as brick areas, and you had to build brick. But they had a regulation which said, if you build more, and this is in imperial dimensions, if you build more than 50 or 60 feet back from the front boundary, then you can build in timber. And that was meant for sheds and garden sheds and things like that. Well, we were building hundreds of feet back from the front boundary. So I, I, I pointed that, I said, look, it isn't a brick house, but I said, we are well back from the boundary, so that clause will still apply. He said, oh yes, that's right. And that's how it got through. That's about the only regulation we discussed. And now people don't believe it, but that's exactly what happened, yeah. And no discussion about the experimental nature of the no. structure? No, nothing, no. And uh, I had to um, get a mortgage to, to build it uh, with the uh, AMP Society. And I didn't think they would be very happy about building, giving me a mortgage to, to uh, build something like this. But they, but they did. <laughs> I don't know why that happened, but I didn't have any trouble to get a mortgage to the AMP Society either. So, <laughs> uh, you know, compared to actually building something today, it is just extraordinary because the, the amount of regulations and, and procedures that we have to go through today to, to get a building erected, uh, uh, you just, it, it'd be impossible to compare the two, and yet there's only some 50 or 60 years difference in, in, the, in the timing. Now, I really enjoyed reading that you thought the only reason you won the Olympic Park swimming competition was because you were the only young architect left in town due to your large mortgage on the land in Kew. <laughs> no, I've been misquoted there. Well, when I, uh, what, what used to happen in uh, that, that competition was in 1952. What used to happen uh, is that um, architects, when they graduated, immediately went on a tour. They would get on a boat and uh, sail to London and get a job in London and then uh, tour around Europe and then when they'd finished that they would travel across uh, to Canada get a job there and then they would illegally come down to New York and hopefully get a job down there and then they'd come back uh, over to the, the west coast and um, and then sail back to Melbourne and uh, <clears throat> I think I don't know what, what uh, this was because uh, none of us had been to Europe and none of us had been to the United States uh, but we'd studied it so much, and uh, just a desire after the war to, to, to travel. And everybody did that in my year. My year was made up of about 10% or 15% of, of ex-servicemen, uh, and they didn't want to travel because they'd been travelling, so they stayed here. So my, one of my closest friends was John Murphy, and, and the other one was Kevin Morland, and they were both, one was in the Army and the other was in the Navy, and uh, they didn't want to travel. <laughs> so they were my friends and we all grouped together to do that competition. You've talked about the fact that you actually won due to the economy of the, of the structure. Oh yes, I can explain that. Be because um, it wasn't very popular to have the Olympic Games in Melbourne. There's a tremendous shortage of, of infrastructure. Houses were being built in, in areas out on the outskirts of Melbourne with unmade roads. And, uh, and without uh, proper servicing, no sewerage, and all, all sorts of things like this. And uh, so many people in Melbourne felt, well, why are we spending money on, on Olympic Games 
when we are so in need of our own infrastructure to be developed. So there, there was a, a, a great difficulty about that. But uh, it, the, it was considered a great honor so that, that it did go ahead with the games. But um, in the competition conditions, they specifically said um, that, that there had to be the economy of means, that, that, that the, the, the building had to be built as economically as possible. This was emphasized again and again in the competition. And this obviously is because of the conditions in Melbourne, that, that, that shortage of materials, shortage of labor, things weren't getting done for a lot of people. So um, uh, the whole idea of using counterbalancing of forces would enable us to reduce the tonnage of steel in the building. There was a conventional way of building the building, uh, possibly arching across in steel and, and having steel columns. Uh, but we came up with this idea of, of the counterbalancing of the forces uh, and this reduced the tonnage. And we um, worked with a, a guy that uh, was uh, in an engineering office where we were. Uh, he was joining us and we used to have lunch together. And we explained this idea to him and he confirmed, yes, we were going to be able to reduce the steel quite dramatically. Uh, so that, that's what we submitted. And luckily enough, on the, on the panel of judges was Professor Francis, who was Professor of Engineering. So the, because we, we actually submitted our computations and, and said that we'd reduced the steel tonnage, but most of the jury weren't capable of assessing whether that was true. But they turned to uh, Professor Francis and they said, have a look at this, is this true? And he came back and said, yes. He said, this is, this is a brilliant design. This, is, this does reduce the steel tonnage. That's how we won. So when you did get to travel, which is a little bit later in your career, you, yeah. you've talked about how it profoundly changed the way that you practiced architecture. Yes. Um, yes, it did. Uh, my first trip to Europe was in 1960, and I went there on this trip solo by myself, my, dear, my wife Dioni stayed back to look after what practice we had left because by that stage I'd been working in such avant-garde buildings uh, that um, I, I didn't have many clients left. <laughs> and I could see other architects from my era around me being very successful and, and making a great fist of their, of their career. So uh, <clears throat> I went overseas to try to, to get another perspective on life and um, I realized what a small fish I was in a big pond because I was <laughs> my I think after winning the pool I, my head must have been a bit swollen I think and anyhow I came down to earth very cl clearly after that trip and I came back with the decision that I was going to really establish a commercial practice and that's quite a different uh, sort of direction that I had been going on and I started um, getting clients doing commercial buildings and and changing everything so the trip overseas uh, it was a culmination of, of that, that avant-garde period of my life in the 1950s and then what I did in 1960. And with 70 years of practice and with yeah. no signs of slowing down, what are you most proud of? In the way of buildings and things? Mm. Well, I, I don't really have a single, uh, a single building. I, I, have, I haven't... Uh, well, for example, the building I really achieved what I wanted to more than else was my, uh, my own house down at Mornington. It's called the Sea House. And I think, uh, like a building that I've done more recently, like the, the library at Trinity Grammar School, has the same sort of quality, and that is that it responds emotionally to how the building is to be used. That, that's been... What I've learned in life, look, architects in my era were all trained in what we call the functional school. And function meant that if you were in a kitchen, uh, you'd be close to where you, and you were making coffee. You could get to the refrigerator, get to the coffee machine, you'd get to the sink without walking too far. You know, it'd all be sort of functional. And it was physical function. And, you, and we, buildings had to express themselves functionally. You know, if a, if a building required a certain shape to be functional, then that had to be expressed when you, when you did the building. This was a functional school. But never ever in my training were people talking about how people feel in the building. I mean, yes, you can make the cup of coffee easily, but how do you feel in that kitchen? How do you feel? Now, I started developing uh, halfway through my career, trying to establish how 
people, I studied how people felt. I built up a vocabulary of people's reaction to spaces. Um, I'd watch where they would sit when they walk into a cafe, when the chairs were all open and they could select a table. And I'd say to myself, well, why have they selected that table? And they might repeatedly select that table, other people. And I'd say, because they feel better there. Why do they feel better there? I'd learn things like this. And I built up a vocabulary of, of how people feel in spaces and colors and textures and, uh, and, and I developed a career around that. And I achieved that in my Mornington house and better than any other way I had done it. And I also did it just recently in, in, the, in the Trinity Graham School Library. Um, the buildings that when people go into them, they, uh, they come out and they say, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, I, I, they, have a, they talk about the way they feel. Uh, so I can see that those are the sort of buildings that I've really been trying to achieve. And it's very hard to achieve it, very hard. I, I'm very dissatisfied with a lot of buildings I've built, uh, and um, so I don't always achieve it. But I, I felt I achieved at least those two. But I suppose they don't really relate to the most significant thing I've done in life from the point of view of other people. I, I think the, uh, I introduced uh, strategic planning to Australia, and that was that came out of working with Robin Boyd. Uh, Robin uh, and I and Reg Grouse worked on the um, uh, architectural convention at Sunbury. We got Dick Hamer to agree that we would make a working thing at Sunbury. This is because we thought we weren't achieving enough with designing buildings. We wanted to get on a broader scale. So we got into the idea of designing a whole town at, at uh, developing the design for the Sunbury town. And uh, the convention opened on the Saturday morning and Robin died on the Friday night. And um, so this was terrible. And I then tried to carry on about planning. And then I discovered uh, by reading uh, that um, and studying that Otto Konigsberger had developed a method of strategic planning. He was University College London and uh, he uh, it was about understanding that cities are three-dimensional things and that they're living things, living organisms, and they're not just zoning plans. Melbourne's plan was houses here, factories here, commercial buildings here. That was considered a plan. But it, it wasn't like that. A, plan, a city is different. And Königsberg had developed this process of strategic planning. And we got Dick Hamer to uh, insist that the Melbourne City Council advertise for planners to produce a strategic plan for Melbourne. And we won it. And I think that was possibly one of the most significant things I've ever done, but probably also building a whole town like Dinner Plain. That was also. Well, and that leads me to my final question about the changing face of Melbourne and yeah. what you think over the last 70 years of your career, um, from your professional perspective, but also from your perspective here in Kew, what do you think of Melbourne now and, and, and the future direction of the city? Well, I wish I could be very happy about that, but I'm not. Uh, because um, you, can't in, you, you can't actually increase density of a, of, a, of a city and not bring infrastructure with it. It's, 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 they, they go together, the things. On the other hand, you can't actually just put infrastructure in and not understand what that will do. I mean, if you build a major highway, as they did out towards Gisborne, and not understand what would happen with the land around the highway, because it would encourage people to go out there. You, they go hand in hand. Increasing density and infrastructure have to go together, and infrastructure can't be done by itself without understanding what happens around it. So unfortunately, Melbourne has allowed uh, places like Docklands to develop without uh, giving that overall concept of what goes with it. Uh, and increasing density, I mean, why have we allowed so much increased density in the city? We actually proposed increasing density in the city in our strategic plan, but we emphasized the infrastructure that had to go with it. Uh, and um, for example, our rail system. Our rail system was one of the, we, we at, in, in the 50s, we had more rail per head of population than almost any other city in the world. That was done in the 1890s because of the, uh, Gold rush, the, no, I'm sorry, land speculation. Gold rush, land speculation. 
land speculation. We'd build railway lines out to, to dig as rest, and we'd subdivide the land out there and put up a tent and have an auction. And so we extended this rail network. So it was a marvellous rail network, but we didn't work on it. We didn't improve it. And back in the 50s, the signalling system was going down. and it was. But we emphasised in that strategic plan the importance of the transport system and how the city would come to a grinding halt unless you allowed this to happen. But of course, cars are so popular. Cars are everything to everybody. They'd drive them into their bedroom if they could. It's, uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable, the power of cars. And uh, uh, when, uh, when we built the underground stations, uh, this, this was a marvellous thing we did because we, we doubled the capacity of the rail system in doing that. People thought it just meant to be distributed around the city. But <clears throat> what it meant is the trains were coming in to Flinders Street, unloading and going back over the same rail. So building the underground rail, we allowed the trains to come in, unload, and then go out to the west. So there wasn't that delay in the train. So it doubled the capacity building that, that, that system. And we praised that. And uh, we uh, then uh, recommended all sorts of other things about public transport. But of course, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because in a democracy, politicians have to sort of relate to what people want. But... If people are wanting the wrong thing, then you need a politician who is, becomes a statesman, who can actually change people's opinion and explain to them what will happen if they just do what they wanted to do. So people wanted to use cars, so the politicians allowed more and more freeways, more and more cars. We knew that in America, if you build a freeway, it'll just attract more cars, it'll just block up, then you'd have to do another freeway, and there's no end to that. There has to be other ways of doing it. So, unfortunately, Melbourne has been affected by that. Well, thank you, Peter. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Good. <laughs>